So I know um, one thing that's jumped out to us that's been really fascinating, and, and maybe this is a byproduct of some of what you're noting, the culture and moving quickly and iterating and optimizing, but I know when we initially saw the recorner concept, I think it was at CES, there was a version of it there, and Oh, not too much later when we saw it at Work Truck Week, there was a completely sort of new and optimized version of it, right? And it was fascinating to see. I think that's something more recently in the automotive space that we've seen is sort of this challenging of the normal development cycle and how quickly things iterate and really moving more towards like, and it's interesting when you introduce the company and calling it like a technology company and, and focusing on some of the software, I think a lot of companies are trying or, or either trying to or being forced to sort of rectify that transition to where, you know, conventional automotive development cycles or product development cycles, years and years, that just doesn't fly as much anymore. So it's obvious yeah. you guys are moving quickly. Um, I'd imagine as VP of engineering, you're probably leading the team that's making those optimization efforts take place. Like, I was curious, maybe you could tell us from like that initial version we saw to the new one, like how how that optimization process works within your team and is it has it reached its final form or, or are, are we still on an iterative path here uh, as we head yeah. to production? This is a really good question. So we've, you're right, we started off with what we call our B sample, which is what you first saw, which mm -hmm. was the, the, first, the first corner that we, um, that we engineered in the UK. Mm -hmm. and, and that was, that was done to be very fast to get a product together. And, and conventionally, you would design something, you would then in, do some analysis, you might then refine it, you then build it, you then test it, and then once you've got the test results, you go into the next phase. Mm -hmm. And we realized to, to get our product to market, we can't follow that sequential kind of timeline. We've got to sure. run a few things in parallel, a few things in parallel. So we we what we started to do was say, right, okay, once we've got the first design done, before we've even done any testing, let's let's test it in the virtual world. Let's get it into into simulation, into software and understand we know working with some of our partners, what sort of loads that vehicle is going to experience, what sort of environment that's, that vehicle is going to be in. And we can, from the virtual world, we can then look at how we optimize it. And we actually then ran a load of virtual um, kind of road tests, evaluations, sure, sure. Uh, FE on it to understand where it would be. So we could do that in parallel while we're also then testing the, the, the sample that we've built as sure, well. Sure. And then we correlate back. So we say, actually, and we don't need to be exact. We just need to understand that our deltas, if you like, our changes from one to the other are close enough. Yeah. So it, it's it's running with things in parallel, having managed risk, because sure. there is always a risk, something, but it's, it's, it's a managed risk. And then making sure that you optimize as much as possible in the virtual world before you build something. Sure. And then yeah. once you build it, Feed it back. Yeah, yeah. No, and, it, and it's fascinating to hear. I, I think something that we've heard with clients that we work with recently is that, um, you know, the the correlation between the CAE, the FEA, the simulation, um, obviously there's going to be some correlation and ideally it's, it's really tight, but it's been fascinating to see. I think when people talk about uh, Tesla specifically, there's some things they'll point out where like, man, I don't know how they ever – you know, how they ever arrived at that solution. And, and we've heard things that like people say, well, you know, there is correlation between the simulation and the physical, but sometimes you just have to build it and see how it happens, you know, see how yeah. it reacts and then sort of iterate from there. So co cool to hear that you guys are sort of in parallel paths doing the simulation, but also getting some physical product out there. I know, you know, when we looked at the first version of the product, obviously you guys have refined it, but even that first version, I mean, it wasn't all, you know, brake bent steel welded together kind of stick built. It was still featuring cast aluminum nodes and it still had like, it looked like forged aluminum links. So, you know, ostensibly it could have been a production intent thing, but yeah. it's neat to see it then come a step further. So yeah, just fascinating to see how that, how that's continuing to evolve. And, and we also, one of the, that we've got some, um, we've got a number of key kind of performance requirements we want from our, our corners and also our platforms. And if you think, let, let's talk about this one. The, yeah. The, the, we call our P7 corner, which is the corner we're talking about, yep, is a yep. corner that, that can do from class three to class five products. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 got a range of applications. For sure. So, you, you know, you have to look at the worst case scenario on that and you sure. engineer for the worst case. And then you consider that you're going to carry some over engineering into the lower classes. Sure. Right. But you need you need to optimize that but within all of that. There's also then 
you know, there's weight characteristics, there's then durability characteristics, there's lots of things that we need to engineer into that to make sure we're going through. So when we did the B sample, we, we, we wrote down those requirements and we engineered as close as we could to it. And, and one of the lessons is not just to stick with your, your requirements that you wrote right at the start, is to go back and revisit them and understand whether you've got your requirements right, sure. whether you've actually done, you've spec your targets correctly. And actually we've set ourselves harder targets then for things like weight and things like that. Sure. So what, what you're seeing with the, with what we call the C sample, which is the new one you've talked about, which mm -hmm. is the production end corner is things where we've taken like 20%, 25% weight out of the corner, because that was one of the things we felt wasn't good enough. Yeah. B sample, And we wanted to go forward. So it's, it's constantly evolving. It's constantly looking for improvements is what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I know, I, I think, it was David that we spoke to at one of the shows, but it, I think he noted like something like 40 or 50 pounds came out of each corner, which I mean, for the uninitiated, that's like a massive amount of weight to take out uh, in any vehicle um, and to get it, yeah, at the corners like that. Like I, I wouldn't at first blush have assumed there was that much weight to give. So kudos to the team for continuing to have yeah. that aggressive mentality there. And I think, yeah, the, the willingness to push back on requirements too. That's something that um, we're seeing that those who are trying to be competitive are needing to embrace that mentality, right? Because I think, um, you know, if I'm just transparent about like clients that come to us, if they're more established, I think that one of the, they can kind of use requirements as a, as a barrier or reason not to do things potentially. Um, but, you know, we're seeing as, as new folks are coming into the space, and being willing to push on some of these, they either need to fall in line or they're going to potentially get left behind as far as some of that's concerned. So neat to hear that, that uh, a healthy uh, appetite for revisiting requirements to see if they need to be increased or maybe reeled back or just balanced. I think not treating them like we're set, they're set in stone is probably a big advantage for, for the re-team. And, and, and I think the most important requirement is what does your customer want? For and sure. I think that's the thing where when you look at people like Tesla, they've taken that right from the start. And looking at, we always ask ourselves, what does the customer want from this? Sure. And it may be that engineers can always put in a list of requirements, but actually they don't link back to what the customer really <laughs> wants. You know? Sure. They're very good at that. So you have to keep challenging yourself on that. Yeah. That's one of our favorite things, I think, in uh, like workshops or design efforts with folks when you when you get that like requirement and you ask well what is this requirement what is it based on and, and it's like you play this game of 20 questions to try and get back to the genesis of where it even came from and sometimes yes. you find that it's some like ridiculous unique scenario that happened 50 years ago and it's like okay maybe maybe it's time to reevaluate this um so yeah well and that's one of the advantages not having the burden of of a bunch of legacy baggage and requirements too but yeah fascinating yeah so, so you mentioned customer requirements, and I think this is one of the areas I'm super interested in is, you know, so say, you know, and, and I think on the site or in various materials, we've seen some of the advantages spoken to, and actually, well, why don't, let, let's tee that up, right? So for anyone who hasn't heard about this, the advantages of the re-corner system. If I'm a prospective client, I have commercial vehicles, and I'm here about you guys, I'm interested what's the pitch like what's the advantages that that brings to them and ultimately i'm curious about asking about how they go about implementing it and what roles are played but at a high level maybe the advantages of the corner system uh if you were to sort of yeah. summarize at a high level yeah so let's let's go through this so we've got the re-corner system is the foundation and what we do and that mm -hmm. like i said that gives you a lot of the all of the by wire systems so there's a number of things that come with that mm -hmm. you've got a flexibility of platform in that you can look at the the dimensions of your platform be it the wheelbase or the or the track of the vehicle you're, you're not fixed by investment against a, a fixed dimension of your of your platform you can look at different wheelbases um you can you get a lot of performance benefits from the by wire system we can talk quite a bit about this because it brings you essentially four independent drive units so we can bring things like torque vector in we can bring regenerative braking on all four wheels um we've got four wheel steer in terms of each unit can steer up to 30 32 degrees so you've got big deal for turning um, circle could, turning radiuses yeah, yeah that's so huge in, in urban environments you can you can make you know the, the vehicle kind of go into spaces it probably shouldn't normally go into sure and and, and be quite um, maneuverable and that then also comes with a safety element. So when we talk about this, there's um, the, the amount of 
um, kind of software overchecks and redundancy we've got in our system and mechanical redundancy, it allows then to, to, to kind of step up the safety level. So we've got the ability in, in any environment to, to use the brakes and the steering and, and the traction to make sure that you keep that vehicle in a straight line, in a safe straight line and, and, and um, kind of deliver in, in you know, any kind of fault environment or any crash environment, you've still got a lot of elements that you can use to control the vehicle. Yeah. We talk about it fail operational yeah. So anything happens to the vehicle, it's operational. So, so that gives you all of that. It also then allows you to kind of package everything that you need to, to, to build an electric vehicle within a platform in a very flat environment. We've got everything um, below the kind of well, kind of um, in the floor. So you've got all of your high voltage systems, your cooling systems, your low voltage systems on a flat floor. Yeah which then allows you to have a whole flexibility about your top hats, as we call it, the body yeah. system you on top of it. So you can have different configurations off of one platform. So they could be a box van, it could be a walk-in van, it could be a camper van, it could be lots of different variants that you put on top of, of, of the platform because of the flexibility it gets, gives you. Um, we're all about modularity. We're all yeah. about saying, take our corners, use them, in, in that flexible manner and allows you then to deliver a vehicle that is more bespoke for what the customer needs are than a generic vehicle that you then have to adapt to do what you want it to do.